Hello everyone, this is Shubham Thakur and I'm the founder of Shudu Media and today we have our special guest Mr. Sia Bonga Tivana who is the co-founder of uh, Skywalk Innovations from South Africa. Welcome Mr. Sia, welcome. Uh, thank you Shubham, it is a great pleasure to be in this show. Yeah, thank you, our pleasure. So uh, today uh, we are going to talk about how to start and grow a startup because yeah. nowadays a startup is uh, the startup ecosystem is growing rapidly and exponentially. So here we uh, will look forward to the great insight from Mr. Sia. So with that, I'm going to ask the first question about your company, like what Sky Innovation do? Okay, um, great, thanks. Um, so Sky Innovation, so what we're building as an organization, right? We are building this massive um, innovation hub um, globally, right? So what does that mean is that uh, we have someone in India that wants to build um, a technology startup. We have the knowledge, we have the experience, we can assist from ideation phase all the way to building that product, all the way to taking that product to the market, right? Even if you want to scale into Africa, into South Africa, where I am at the moment, or some of the African uh, markets, that is really who we are. So um, Skyhook has been running for eight years now. Uh, we have um, done work in about... Um, eight countries in three continents. So we've done, I mean, our first international client was in Australia. So we've done an identity verification for those guys. And from then we have done, we've moved to the US. We're actively doing work in Atlanta at the moment. I mean, we're doing work, we've done work in the agri um, tech space. We've done work in background screening space. So geographically, you're looking at um, Australia, you're looking at the US in Atlanta. We're doing, actively doing work in Denmark at the moment. We've done work in the UK. We're doing work in about um, six African countries at the moment. So the way that we've structured our business model is into three ways. So the first one is we have uh, what we call discovery. So in discovery, you've got someone that wants to start a technology startup, but they don't have any ideas on the processes that they need to take to go through, um, you know, validating their idea, you know, uh, building their minimum viable product and going to the market. So we assist them with that particular phase. That's the first one that is discovered. Then the second part is what we call engineering. That's what basically what most people are doing. That is where you want to build um, a mobile app, a web application, an IoT solution, anything tech really. That's where we build it in the engineering phase. And then lastly, uh, we call it growth. So you get people that are building technology solutions, but they don't have, you know, a, techni a technical background. So we act as a chief technology officer to that particular startup uh, to assist them in the best possible ways of how can they continuously leverage, um, you know, technology. Because technology, you know, there are new technologies that comes up um, every week or every month. So we help them in that regard. So the kind of work that we have done, I mean, the size of the clients we've done work in the telco space, We've done work in the agriculture, finance, um, you name them. We've done work with the government in South Africa. We've done work with um, global um, companies uh, in different parts of the world. So in a nutshell, that is really what we do. If there's anyone that want to engage on anything tech-related, um, I'm always open for a chat. That's what we do at Skyhawk. So yeah, uh, so actually, I'm sorry, I was my mic was muted. <laughs> so I was saying, yeah, I was saying that uh, uh, the work you are doing with your business that's so great, and I would like to really congratulate you for that. And Thank uh, you. so, uh, so uh, with that, uh, I think uh, I want to ask this one question: that what things a person should keep in mind before starting a business? Because there are a lot of confusion, a lot of things, and still, like, like, what do you think that? Uh, what type of things a person should really keep in mind before starting a business? Yeah. Cool. Um, great things. That's a great question, um, Shubham, to be honest. So the first one is what we can all experience. Um, it's COVID, right? Yeah. Uh, if you want to start a business, is your business going to be affected uh, by COVID uh, by default? Because if you've got travel restrictions, you know, there are certain restrictions uh, within each and every respective country it doesn't make necessarily sense to understand or to start a business into that particular space, right? So I'll say that to categorize that, the first one is to think about the market trends, right? Uh, what is happening in the market trends? Um, there's something really going about the oil and energy industry at the moment. 
uh, regarding China and some of the African countries. So just to really try to understand what is happening in the market trends in the industry that you want to um, start um, a startup at, right? That is the first one. The second one is what are the regulations in the startup uh, or in the industry you want to start um, your organization? Uh, in many countries, uh, in the fintech space, right? You will find out that there are so many regulations that, you know, um, in South Africa, for instance, there is the Financial Service Board to get a license for starting a fintech company. It's going to take, it's going to cost you a lot of money. It's going to take you a very long time. It just makes sense to partner with someone that already has that particular license. So understand the regulations in the industry where you want to start at. Um, that was the second point. And then the third point, I would say that do you have the knowledge and the background of the industry you want to start, right? Uh, I don't have any, I don't have the knowledge um, in construction. It really doesn't make sense for me to start a business yeah. in construction um, or the oil and energy industry because I don't know that industry. I would be wasting my time. I would, you know, waste uh, my potential client's time. That's that. And the fourth one is look at the problems that are at your hand, right? What are you experiencing at the moment in the um, in the count in the respective country that you're facing, as well as in the global, in a nutshell, the challenges that you're facing. I'll give an example of some of the challenges that we're facing. Water is a scarce resource in many countries, right? So why don't you start something that is gonna um, you know either solve the water scarcity in many countries or a solution that is gonna bring some solution to get people to use water much more resourcefully right that's, those are the one thing uh, those are some of the things um unemployment is also another big thing right so are you in a position to start a solution um that is gonna resolve things like unemployment right and then the fifth thing is what are the opportunities that you have within your respective country um in south africa at the moment you can get the government to offer you a grant fund which is something that you don't have to pay back. It might necessarily be um, $30,000 or $50,000 or even $10,000, right? Are you in a position to actually access those funds so that you can be in a position to get a startup capital um, to fund um, your startup? So sometimes um, government in different countries, they fund specific industries. I know here they fund um, manufacturing, they fund um, agriculture heavily, right? So if yeah. I have some backgrounds in agriculture, you know, or in manufacturing, I have access to um, those particular funds. So I might as well just look into, um, you know, potentially leveraging the resources that are, are there. Lastly, um, you need to look at how big is your pro uh, how big is the problem that you're trying to solve, right? Mm -hmm. um, you want to make sure that you build a startup that has got um, a massive impact. That is called a an opportunity for scalability right so you're looking at um, economies of scale here like i said if you look at the agriculture space or the water uh resource or water scarcity thing which is a global thing so if you can start a startup that is in that particular space if you look at your ubers and you you know i don't like making examples about those uh, about those guys but e-hailing is a you know it's a big industry so transportation in a nutshell is a big industry food security is you know it's a big industry globally so I would say that you need to think about those kind of things um, so before you can eventually start a business. Yeah, exactly. So uh, with that, uh, I, I will ask you the next question is that um, like th that's the thing we should keep in mind uh, before the starting a business. But how do you start a business? Is it necessary to uh, have a team? Is it necessary to, you know, just uh, uh, get the fundings or uh, uh, all the uh, regularities in order to just start a uh, a small business or a big business so uh yeah or maybe like nowadays as uh, if you talk about the tech industry or fintech industry or health tech industry there are so many industries which are associating with uh, tech so uh, like uh, uh, or like somebody uh, like just uh, you can recommend some businesses as well which uh, we can uh, like uh, anyone can start from with uh, with a good internet connection and just a laptop like me yeah <laughs> Yeah, you're right. Um, so starting a business is really easy depending on where you want to start it. Yeah. Like you said just now, um, you can start a business literally anyway, right? I'll yeah. say that the first thing that you need to consider is what are the requirements 
um, in terms of regulation to start a business, right? Yeah. Uh, here in South Africa, it would cost you, uh, if I can just do the conversion, um, uh, here in South Africa, it's going to cost you about $11 or $12 to start a business. That's it. Oh. Right? Uh, yeah, seriously. Uh, it's going to cost you about 12, 000, um, 12 um, US dollars um to start a business and that's it you've got your business set up um that's the first thing look at wherever you want to start i mean now i can start a business in the uk or anywhere else look at what are the requirements to start a business the costs associated with starting a business in that particular um country or continent and then the next thing is um the re registration to the revenue service right we all need to pay taxes uh you know when it comes to uh running a startup so i understand yeah. Um, if you um, have that time and flexibility and crazy enough to want to start a business anywhere, you can look at the tax benefits or the tax incentives um, that different countries are offering. Um, you know, you can have a look into that. And then um, apart from that, I mean, it's just a matter of now. I always advise people to start a business that doesn't require capital intensive in the beginning. Yeah, exactly. right? So if you can have a laptop access to internet and to start a business by all means start that do some consulting um get some little bit of money there and there and it won't cost you that much i mean if you can go and sit at the fast food shop whether it's mcdonald's or whatever escapes you know they have oh we're back so yeah you know um you can use um that free internet service from uh, some of the restaurants which really won't cost you that much to actually start some of the incubators um coffee shops they allow you to actually use their internet right it will just cost you probably a coffee a day uh, possibly yeah. but yeah i would say that look at um the requirements of the regulations the revenue services uh, what yeah. are the tax benefits that you can get um to the country where you want to start a business and then by, uh, after that by all means, launch your startup. Yeah, exactly. So uh, there is a uh, trend is going on. Like people are so like there are so many people who are talking about get, getting the funding because uh, even if you are like people have a crazy ideas about edtech startups right now. Like in India, the like, uh, fintech and uh, uh, the edutech they are on the scale. Like uh, we had thirty six unicorn last year, and before that, like all years combined, we have thirty seven unicorns in town. So nice. like, that, that's how it's like making people are making it back in by like being in the home uh, and, uh, you know, just making you uh, making the right use of the tools. So they are actually there is a, a startup called Luna. Uh, I think I'm not allowed to uh, make copyright issue or something. So, yeah, like there is a, a startup who just raise uh, uh, like 25 crores and it's like it's a huge amount of money just to get funding because of the idea. So uh, I just want to ask you, like, how to get the funding? For, uh, for your initial stage of business. Yeah. Cool. Thanks. That's a great question. Almost every startup, they say, you know, um, it's difficult to start a business because there is lack of funding. It makes sense. Um, so, you know, funders, they differ, right? Um, I spoke to an impact funder from Qatar uh, last week, Friday, right? It says, if you have anyone that has got that is running a startup that is impactful into the community or to the society, by all means, I'm keen to have a conversation with them. So I think this is the best time to actually launch a startup um, because we are like living in a one massive com economic com community where you can literally have a conversation with an investor in Nigeria, in San Francisco, in um, Germany, anywhere really, right? So there's that um, advantage at the moment due to COVID, thanks to COVID. Uh, those are one of the advantages regarding that. So some of the funders, sometimes they're looking at what have you done so far, right? What have you invested um, yourself so far? So if you haven't invested anything um, of, out of your own money, some other people, they are quite skeptical about that. And then if you haven't ran a startup before, right? Uh, for myself, if I were to create another startup, and say, yeah. look, I'm raising funding. They'll say, okay, have you run a startup before? I said, yeah, I've run a startup, the Skyhawk Innovations. We have done work in multiple um, continents and, you know, I managed to scale that business. So sometimes they invest in the person less on the idea itself, right? So I would say yeah. that if anyone wants to run a startup, and 
you get a lot of people that you get a lot of funders that are looking for opportunities at the moment to do uh, some investment and they want to invest as early as possible so i'll say that if you can start your business and um, get some little bit of traction and um, generate some little bit of revenue you don't have to have figured out your entire business model of how everything is going to work but you yeah. stand a better chance to raise um you know funding and the other note that i would say to entrepreneurs uh, to the startup founders is that the moment you decide to start a startup start building relationships with funders right yeah. because people will watch your sort of your growth are uh, you and i should probably we speak um almost every week right you yeah. know my progress i know your progress you get to a point where you're looking for funding i can introduce it to other people that you know they can be in a position to fund um your chain so i would say that build a relationship with um investors as early as possible as much as you want to build or establish a relationship with your potential customers or your strategic partnerships exactly um, so i'd say uh, people have to look into that but there is a lot of funding out there um as long as you can solve a particular problem that is in the sort of category of that particular fund and like i just said the fund that i spoke to is in qatar um on friday it's just looking for impact um you know or social um social kind of um startups so okay there are people that are looking for just exclusively um agriculture sort of kind of or agri-tech kind of solutions other people are looking for prop tech uh, kind of solutions or fintech kind of startups right so understand uh, which kind of investors um uh, what are their requirements and to start building that relationship as quickly as possible yeah exactly so actually if we talk about my business right now with which i'm running is that uh, I'm actually building an audience so that uh, I can uh, present to the you know like uh, fund uh, like the investors and all so that I can I'm actually thinking to uh, you know like grow it globally like in several countries like as I'm talking to you right now so uh, so yeah like uh, uh, like getting the audience from South Africa and making uh, people connect there and then there is so many things so yeah I would uh, I would literally research about it and I will uh, take it ahead yeah so, so 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 here's one here's one other thing that people can um actually have a look into right don't i'll share i know that we're going to speak about the books that you read there's this other book um it's a very interesting book but i will share i know that this is part of the conversation but then what i would say is that um you don't have to look for funding when it is critical to look for funding right okay. uh, because at that time you will run out of your runway and to get funding might take some time right yeah uh, you might get an arrangement or an agreement that you know what we are willing to uh, give you an investment of this much at this particular valuation but for them to clear the amount into your bank account that might take some time so exactly. what i would say is that when people um or when um the startup founders you start a startup let's say um this is the day i'm starting my startup today right you already know what i need to do i already need to start building relationships with potential funders or do some research which kind of funders are funding which kind of startups right build on some relationship with them uh you know network with them if you can find um people like yourself that can introduce it to people that you know they've got that investment ask that introduction but then the existing called being funding ready right so being funding ready i think they can be i, I think i'm not so sure because i know some of my uh, friends they are running a funding readiness um sort of workshops right if yeah. you can find a, a funding readiness workshop or you can youtube you can try to search it on youtube or any of these um you know you can search it online by all means get there try to um understand what is funding ready actually looks like what are the mistakes some of the people have made um and i and if you can read some of the books like the one that i'm gonna recommend uh, at the later stage by all means go there research about them and uh, note them down yeah sure so uh we'll surely uh, look into it and uh, let's forward to the next question is that the when you start everything like when you start a business the first thing comes up in your mind is that how to create a product a better product which will actually work in the market because market is really really hard and there is so many competitors as well who are doing great than you but you just need to stand out and is it necessarily not important because if you have value people will come to you so i just want to ask you this that how to create a product or uh, do a product testing for your business at the initial level cool so i would like to 
or restructure the question um, by answering, you know, the question. So the first conception, well, the first thing is that what are the misconceptions about product development, right? Yeah. Um, so people, they think that I need to build the entire product before I can go to market and speak to the customers. That is the one biggest mistake, right? Uh, some other people, they think that I need to raise the funding first before I can start building the product. That is also another mistake. Uh, people yeah. think that I need to find a business model before I can um, go to the market. That is also another mistake. If you look at um, books, like if you look at the story of Netflix, it's just that Netflix, it's not only Netflix alone. There are a lot of startups that are well known out there. They didn't have a business model on this. Even Google themselves, right? Yeah. Uh, they didn't have um, a business model that was going to be repeatable and um, that is also scalable. We just went out there. So therefore, my other point is that you don't have to find a business model before before you can go to market. Um, geez, I forgot other misconceptions, but nonetheless, therefore now when it comes to building a product and taking it to the market, the first thing that you need to, let us use a typical example, right? Yeah. Let us use a typical example. Uh, I love this example because I can relate to this example. Some other people can relate this to this example. So. In at Skywalk, we have Secret Santa every year. So okay. uh, we do a random um, name um, selections, and then you buy a gift for that person. I always struggle with um, who do I buy a gift for, right? And what kind yeah. of a gift will that person potentially like and stuff like that. And it happened for about a couple of years. I said, you know what? This is the biggest problem, right? Um, how do I go about this thing? Then I started doing research and I started, you know, um, finding out what are other platforms that are there. Started doing research um, and I've asked some other people. So the first um, research is you can do a secondary research. Do a Google search, uh, find out, um, you know, who are the people that are out there, what is already out there in the market, right? That's the first um, search. The second um, um, sort of research that you can do is ask other people, Hi, are you struggling with buying gifts, um, you know, for people, whether it's for a birthday, baby shower, whatever the case may be, or a wedding, whatever the case might be, right? Yeah. Yeah, I'm struggling. That is also another primary research to uh, when you're starting um, the startup, right? And then thereafter, um, I went out to look for competitions um, that are out there in the market. I've downloaded yeah. some few different apps. I've looked at how they work. I've seen a gap on what they're doing, which I really yeah. didn't like, you know, some of their features. Then thereafter, I came up with what is a minimum viable product for me. So, yeah. which was, um, if it is an exact group of people, like at Skywalk, uh, I get everyone to actually um, download the app, uh, insert their name in there. Then you've got uh, everyone's name. Click on the app, and then it sort of kind of randomly checks. It, it kind of randomly gives you a name um, that you need to buy a gift for, right? Mm-hmm. But then with that, it is also... When you register on the platform, you should also select some of the things that are of interest to you. With me, you would know. I love reading, right? So I'd yeah. say I love reading. Uh, if there's anything that I like, I mean, you can, se- can select a budget. And therefore, anyone that um, would have to buy a gift for me will get those recommendations. You know what? See, I like this and that, and therefore, they can be in a position to buy them. I've been thinking about that for a very long time, <laughs> up until... I saw someone that did exactly the same thing. I think they're from the US. Um, and then, you know, but we're not going to speak about that. But then what I'm, where I'm getting to is that the first part when you're building a product is understand the challenges that you're facing on a daily basis, yeah. right? Uh, what are the challenges that you're facing yourself? The second thing is do um, a secondary research. What is already out there in the market? Um, you know, the third part is um, validate with the potential customers. Hey, I'm struggling with this. Um, understand. Do you mind if I can draw something on the board? Yeah, for sure, for sure. <laughs> cool. Um, I don't know where is my. Um, uh, just give me a sec. Because... Yeah, for sure. Uh, Oh, I found it. Yeah. Uh, I found it. 
Yeah. Right. So this is your concept, right? Um, yeah. uh, this is your concept. Then this is the market. Exactly. Right? Yeah. So in the market, you I would use um, A, B, C, and D. Right. So you've got A. A, A, and A, B, C, D, A, B, C, D, A, B, C, right? So what yeah. you want to do essentially is that when you've got that concept, you want to understand, um, you want to find a minimum viable product that you're going to build for your customers. You want to look for people that are like these ones, your A's, right? Yeah. Because they've got a similar problem um and then you can potentially address that particular problem however if you try to um this is your concept you speak to these guys they said yeah that is a problem you speak to this guy yeah that's a problem but it's not a high priority to me this is a problem if you can have if you can add apc to your product maybe i can potentially use it at the end of the day yeah. you're not going to be able to address the entire market all at once look at the guys that have got a similar problem that you can potentially address um, with exactly. just a minimum viable product, right? So yeah. that is the one thing that I'll also um, encourage people because you get people that they start up with a minimum viable product, by the end of the day, they've built a Ferrari, whereas you don't have the resources, you don't have everything to actually build it. So I'd say yeah. that if, when it comes to product development, don't always also, the last point, don't always look at um, using or start um costing the development itself sometimes you don't have to start with the development there are so many resources which i'm happy to share i mean a a linkedin poll you know yeah. just to ask a, a quiz you know people to respond to that that can also be one of the ways to validate your idea uh, a facebook ad or a facebook post can be one of the ways uh, a google form can also be one of the ways there's so much that you can use to actually validate your product without spending any cent to find a developer to build that product for you. Exactly. Like that's, that's the, uh, what should I say, like very important insight from you. Like, uh, like there are so many free resources that are available. It's it just, uh, we need to have that, you know, like uh, the curiosity or uh, the yeah. uh, hunger to build the uh, build the business. So yeah, like, and, and the next point is coming that uh, I'm asking you the next question is that, like uh, there is a difference between uh, growing a business and scaling a business. Okay, so um, I actually I actually read some uh, I actually watched something and where it was like uh, uh, like people uh, whose business are not growing they are still doing some you know like uh, try to expand and like uh, yeah like if you talk about like I live in Delhi so uh, like my uh, business is not growing in uh, okay let's let's take a, take the example of uh, the country itself if my business is not growing uh, like I'm firstly I'm thinking to grow my business in India. If it's not growing in India, but I'm still thinking to, you know, like uh, hop into other countries as well. So that's not going to work. That is uh, like, uh, uh, so that's the difference like uh, between uh, growing and scaling. So I just want you to elaborate from your side because you are already, uh, you know, you're already uh, scaling the business in the various countries and how you are doing that is so incredible. So yeah, let's, let's talk about it. Um, cool. Uh, thanks. That is also another great, interesting question. So I'll respond it with um, a sort of um, analogy that we were given by my business partner's, uh, my business partner's mom, right? Yeah. So regarding this conversation. So she is in the trucking business, so they sell trucks. She works for Volvo, right? Yeah. So their direct competitor is Mercedes. Right, as Mercedes okay. truck, and they um, sell Volvo trucks. So what happens is that she was speaking to us or educating us about the difference between market share and bottom line, right? So Mercedes will invest um, as much as possible just to get a market share. So they'll tell you that we've got 50% or 70% of market share of trucks being sold in South Africa as an example, right? And then for them, for bottom line, it's, is that business profitable, right? Are they covering all the expenses? Um, is that business growing as well? 
um, they don't care about the uh, market share, but they want to grow to the point where the bottom line is actually being covered. Okay. You understand? So that's the one analogy that I want to share um, regarding, um, you know, growing a business as well as scaling a business. That's the one. That's the one example. The se second example that I'm going to use is the example of using our business. When we started off Skywalk, we didn't have a business model that we're currently using at the moment, right? We're just yeah. building uh, based on the um, client's requirements. Somebody wants a website. By the time when we were doing websites, we we're doing that. Up until as time went by, we started looking at creating a business model of our startup. By that time, we would um, get work in South Africa has got nine different provinces. I think the drive within those provinces, they're probably three and a half hours minimum drive. Um, flights is about one and a half hours to two hours just to travel in these different nine provinces, just to give you context in South Africa, right? Oh. So we started off in one of the provinces in Western Cape, in Cape Town, and then we wanted to grow in Johannesburg, currently where I'm sitting at, right? Okay. And then we got a client there who would fly. The business is growing right yeah. uh we went to another province the business is growing right we're getting a client there uh our name is getting known there um you know we started getting um work in australia the business is still growing in that particular context even to other um into even to other um, sort of continents right so now when it comes to scalability right it comes down to the business model so the business model like i've explained is the first one is discover the phase someone has an idea and wants to build we want to help the person with an idea to eventually take the idea to the market right we've got processes in that model right exactly. it takes six weeks right to get everyone uh, to get the entire exercise or process with that startup that is a business model can we take that business model to india to uh, some of the african countries can we scale that right if we can take that um, and scale it, and you only need um, about two to three people, right? Okay. To, um, to go through that exercise. Can I be in a position that if I want to take it to Mozambique, I want to take it to um, Ghana, I want to take it um, to Czech Republic, can I be in a position that uh, when I get there, if people are interested in that, I just need to get three people, um, and then from then they're going to be in a position to actually do that um, in six weeks. Um, that is what I can define as scalability that. I can take one particular product and I can scale it into multiple countries. And that is one of the ways of scaling. If you look yeah. at uh, building an app, uh, I already know what how long will the app I'm um, going to take and uh, how many people am I going to need. That is not a scalable um, sort of business model because I already know each and every time when I go to a different country uh, how many people yeah. to buy and stuff like that. But if you can take something and be in a position to say, you know what, you need three people. Um, now you set up and then by then these are the things that you need to do for six weeks you want to get the results and then you do that over and over again that is the scalability side of things yeah exactly that's uh like that's is uh what should i say a really uh easy what should i say if uh, you just need to be like more prepared and most importantly excited about what you are doing then yep. i think that that's those things like become very really really easy so yeah. Uh, yeah so like uh, we all spoke about like we spoke about how to business how to grow a business how to scale a business what uh, about product and all but the one thing i just want to uh, highlight as well is that uh, when it comes to uh, the work life balance like if, uh, like in in the initial days there are some days where people just you know like work a lot like 12 hours a day or 14 hours a day uh, so uh, so like how do you like how to make a balance between the life the work life and the personal life because we need to take care of ourselves as well and being a startup owner is not uh, really easy because you know every time you just like okay i can do that i can use that time so that rush in our mind is temp uh, like i think that's the one of the uh, major reason to you know like uh, losing the productivity so what's what's your view of view on that um i have a recommendation of a TED talk by Shonda Rhimes, right? Um, I think she's based in the US. She has written a number of series that are playing on TV in the US. Uh, she speaks about, um, well, her title of the talk is The Year of Saying Yes. Um, okay. 
Yeah, I think so. But I'm, but I'm gonna share that link um, with you. Um, that's the first one. So I'm gonna explain about that um, just shortly. This is actually a very difficult question. If you asked me this question five months ago, I was gonna tell you that for the first three years, work your ass <laughs> off. <laughs> exactly. No watching movies, no watching yeah. movies, no hanging out with friends, no going out, work your ass off into building your startup, right? Yeah. Uh, you don't care what you eat as long as you can keep up with, you know, growing your business, you know, understanding your business processes, getting some revenue. That is what I was going to tell you, right? Um, yeah. At some point, there is that hustle mode. Uh, almost everyone actually went through that. You can't run away from that. You can't escape it. You can't do um, eight, nine hours or 10 hours and say that's it for the day. If you are starting up, I don't think that is really possible. I haven't seen anyone that has actually achieved that. But what I would rather say is that um, you would need to um, work as hard as possible until you can get to the point where you can be in a position to delegate some of the work, right? Yeah. Um, but then there is a conversation that I had with my business partner, well, with my mentor, and um, he asked me a very important question. He asked me that, are you leaving, right? I didn't understand yeah. what that means uh, at the time. It's like, yeah, I understand. Uh, I was giving him some feedback that, you know what, now I've achieved this, now I'm working towards this. He said, yeah, I understand what you're doing. But he asked me that, are you leaving? What that really meant was that... Um, are you actually in a state of mind where you understand what you're doing, what is happening in your life, right? And he gave me um, different things. I actually noted those things down. Uh, if I can find them, uh, just give me a sec. Um, yeah. So, ah, she's the least. Yeah. Maybe not that clear. So, in terms of friendships, the relationships, family wise, your health. Your personal development, which is waiting yeah. to me, work, your career, your business, finances, lifestyle, your spiritual life, right? Yeah. So how are you managing all of these things? Because uh, if you're working way too hard, I've got a daughter and I need to look after my daughter and stuff like that, right? So for me is whatever that you're doing, be cognizant that you need to leave because at some point you can work really hard and your health will be impacted right your business can fail you can start something else or you can get a job until you get back into the feet but your health you're not going to get that back so whatever that you're doing i think that you need to have a you need to think about those but for me when i'm starting up three things that are important um two or three things the first one is am i working hard enough to outcompete the next person right yeah. um, then the second thing is am i equipping or educating myself um to stay relevant into the market yeah. right and then the last thing really is just it depending on if whether you have a team am i looking after my team and i'm also looking after my clients to make sure that i continuously build something that uh, my clients would like and also my team would enjoy working with us so yeah. those are the things yes so uh like uh that is really really important and uh like I'm really into like spiritual things, like not uh, the uh, like you know worshiping or not, but I do believe like once we are uh, like we uh, have a control over this, we can control everything because that's yeah. the yeah like uh, you know like, uh, like mind is like literally is the powerful tool in the world like every person can have and literally we have to take control of this like yeah right now I'm at this stage where I know. Uh, what I'm feeling and I know how to tackle it. It's just that I just need to, like, I just uh, got the skill of self-accepting. Like, if I'm angry, why I'm angry and what it's going to be the result, okay? So I automatically get uh, calm. So that's how we just need to analyze and uh, make a real work uh, life balance. And I really think that that's really help people, like, that's really helped me to understand people in their health level as well. So, like, moving forward to the next question is that, uh, uh, wait, wait, before, before we jump into the next question, really, yeah. before we jump into the next question, so like you're right, so managing a work-life balance is a very um, difficult thing. Like myself, I think looking at the time difference um, between us and you guys, I'm already about, uh, work about nine hours already, if not 10, um, still awake, doing work, reading and stuff like that. 
I only had a sandwich, right? Which was about two hours ago. And I started to work uh, at about six and now it's about, you know, five. So I didn't manage to actually, you know, eat well and stuff like that. But then I want to share something about the work-life balance, uh, which what Shonda Rhimes have mentioned, which has changed my life completely, which was she writes about three different um, TV series and each of them has got about 24 to 30 episodes. She's managing a team of about, I don't know how many people really like. So each and every time she has to think logically, think about a script to write about the next episode um, or the next season of a particular episode. Yeah. And those seasons, they'll have all of this. And then when she speaks about the things that she, do, she does, you're like, woman, where do you have time? And she's got three daughters at the time when I listen to that uh, TED Talk. And then she posed in, in her TED Talk, she posed and said that, you know what? You work hard because work is, is, is exciting for you, right? Yeah. I can do, like, I know you. You you can do 18 hours or 12 hours. You rest because you want to rest or you've got some other reasons specifically you don't have uh, looking at the screen for a long time. But then no one is forcing you to do It's exciting, right? Um, exactly. You. So he then, she then asked that, what do you do when what you do is no longer exciting, right? Uh, when the work that you do, it feels like you're a slave. Now, it's no longer as exciting as it yeah. used to be. And with her, um, um, towards the end of the thing, towards the end of the TED Talk, she said, um, one day I was rushing to a meeting and, my, and, and, and her daughter asked her to play. She said, yes, why not? She postponed the meeting. She played with her daughter for 20 minutes. Um, you know, she got relieved. She came to her senses. She, you know, she got excited. Um, you know, she... She came back to her normality yeah. that, you know what, you know, we play with our kids. And it's the thing that she's always um, emphasizing on her TED Talk that play some time, give some time to play with your kids. They're not going to take so much of your time. Put your phone away. They're going to take about 10, 15 minutes of your time. The next thing they're already bored with you. They want to do something else to the guys that have got kids. But then find something that you're going to do that, uh, yeah. even if it's a tennis match or whatever the case might be. But then once you're done with that, you come back to you your workstation, you're fresh, yeah. you um, you know, enthusiastic again with the work, and then you continuously do what you need to do. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, that's the that's what I, oh, what I'm trying to say as well. Like, it's it's really really refreshing when yeah when we are with our friends and the family, which helps. Like, mental support is really really necessary. So let's jump onto the next question. Is that uh, according to you, what are the top industries? where we can start a business now um i'll say fintech is one of the biggest one yeah. right yeah. um health tech is another one just that it's well in different countries health it's a very sensitive um industry so when yeah. you get there you need to be very sensitive about the regulations people's data cyber security and stuff like that I would say that people need to be cognizant of that. And then Agritech is also another one because food security is always, you know, the big thing. I don't care what happens with COVID or anything else. We always need to eat, right, okay. at the end of the day. So if you are in a position to build something really innovative in the Agritech space, um, I would say that people need to have a look into that. Um, yeah, look and... The other sort of things that or technologies people can look into and see how they can already add value into those existing industries. Um, things like AI, like artificial yeah. intelligence. Uh, people are using um, artificial intelligence to really transform the insurance um, industry. So insurtech, yeah. insurtech is also another industry that, that people can have a look into it because those massive insurance companies, they're no longer doing any justice for us. And people are smart enough at the moment to make um, decisions by themselves at the moment, right? Yeah. And then there is also, uh, you know, your machine learning. So what I do in the machine learning, big data space, you know, there's deep learning, there's all of these technologies that are out there uh, that are already playing a role. Um, there's also the most important one, which is cybersecurity, right? Um, yeah. How can you build um you know something in the cyber security space because cyber security is definitely going to be there for long everyone people's data you know there's poppy act um in different countries people want to know is my data up safe right 
Um, yeah. You know, if I go somewhere else and somebody steal my passport, you know, am I safe? Am I vulnerable to other things, right? We know, we all know about that. So I'd say people have to have a look into that. And then the other mm -hmm. one is prop tech, right? Um, the property industry, uh, we always look for a place to stay. And people, uh, it, I don't know about, you know, possibly other, in the, other continents or countries, but what I've noticed is that things have changed due to, you know, all of these technologies, due to all of this funding, due to all of, um, you know, all of these um, economic activities that are happening worldwide. People are yeah. moving from um, lower income sort of bracket to a mid uh, to a medium uh, to a middle income. So yeah. those people now they are looking at um, you know what can I do more uh, with the income that I'm actually making at the moment. So you, you have to think about what are the things that you can do that you can start looking at extracting some revenue from those uh, medium income people because you know they want to go. As long as that things might happen. Yeah, you there? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So so yeah, on the on that question, the last point is ed tech, right? Uh, yeah. People have been disrupted by going at a physical school to go and learn this e-learning that is happening. So EdTech is definitely one of the, we have seen, I think, a South African startup that has just uh, became a unicorn um, just in the education um, technology space. So those are industries that I think at the moment uh, people can definitely have a look into. Um, and especially FinTech, I always have people that want to venture into FinTech almost every yeah. week with the that I speak to. Yeah, that's uh, that's great. And these are the industry we should focus on <laughs> literally. So yeah. now I'm asking the last question, and which is the uh, dark question, which I've been really, really waiting personally since the session began is that please give some good book recommendation because I know you read a lot and you read a really, really good books and I would love to read and love to explore. Yeah. Cool. So I, I, uh, you know, I'm a fan of, uh, I'm a fan of reading. So, um, <clears throat> this is my new read. Okay. Uh, failing to win. Okay. This was. This is a startup. Um, um, started by um a guy. <clears throat> the startup um started actually in Zambia. They're in the fintech space. Okay. Right. Um, I just guys, this is the, this book is really interesting. So if I can just share some of the content of the book, I don't know yeah. if you are in a position to actually see, um, but this guy speaks about anything and everything about a startup, right? Oh, yeah. I think share some of the uh, topics is failing to become a team, right? You yeah. always have a team in your startup, uh, but failing yeah. to become a team, failing to manage your board. Uh, we started to onboard um, board members in our organization. And out of reading this book, I've learned so much about managing a board. We've never managed a board before. Um, failing to focus, right? He shares um, very um, detailed information of how do they fail to focus on their startup, uh, failing yeah. to design a culture, company culture. You know, your Google has got the great company culture and other you know organization. Um, he speaks about that. Failing to expand. We spoke about the scale, um, scalability not so, um, not so long ago. Failing to lead the market, failing to close investment right failing yeah. to exit um i think it, it covers most of the things that um startup founders usually goes into um and i think it's one of the great books and then i've got adam grant he's also one yeah. of my favorite um he's also yeah, one, of my too. <laughs> one of my favorite authors but then this book really what it does he always challenges things that you always or you already know but then he always gives you that thing that um is that really the best way to actually go about it right it always challenges everything that you know i yeah. I, I let them grant wait uh, right and then um this is a new book 
Yeah, I got it. Uh, yeah, I got it. I got it um, three or four days ago. So um, I've read about a couple of chat, uh, chapters at the moment. So therefore, if anyone is a startup founder, Way of the yeah. Wolf is one of the best uh, books that you can definitely read. I'm just peering around some of the books. Mark Manson is also... Yeah, I have read it. I have read it. <laughs> yeah. So um, even that book, um, everything is fuck. No, no. no. Um, what is that other book that he wrote? Um, the Subtle that's, of Not Giving a Fuck. Yeah, The Subtle Art of Not Giving a Fuck. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So um, he's also a great author. Um, there's also another book. It's just not um, in my, in front of me. Um, it is... Um, that will never work. It's a story about Netflix, right? Ooh. So people, yeah, that will never work. Uh, it's a story about Netflix. Um, please do. Um, people should actually have a look into that, and you'll understand what I like about that book is that you'll understand that you would have an idea. You'll speak to some other few people. Few people they will tell you that will never work, right? Yeah, and exactly. you read that story of how Netflix actually started. Um, and just the way through, you realize that you go through the same things um, with the same critiques of people that are telling you that that is not going to work. And we all know uh, most people are using Netflix at the moment worldwide. So um, that's, you know, another book that I will actually recommend. And other two books uh, I actually don't have in front of me is The Magic of Thinking Big, right? Okay. The Magic of Thinking Big that opens up your thinking to, you know what, it's the best thing now with COVID that you can start a business in India and you can scale it in Ghana, you can scale it in Nigeria, you can scale it in South Africa, you can scale it in San Francisco. So it opens up a person to think beyond their respective, um, you know, um, countries. And then the, yeah, those are the few books that I want to recommend actually. Like surely, uh, like there are new books as well. Like uh, I have read the set a lot of books and all. Uh, the Wolf one by Jordan Belfort and uh, Think Again, and uh, yeah. also like I will and the Failing uh, Failing to Win. I would really, really read that book. And with that, uh, Sia, to be honest, I think this is the best episode I have ever had, and it was really, really uh, wonderful talking to you and getting to know about the startup ecosystem. And I hope audience will love this uh session and uh, i hope like it will help a lot of guys thank you yeah no absolutely thanks again uh, for inviting me so if um if there's one thing that maybe potentially you can do is to understand what kind of topics really does the audience or your audience would like to uh, have and then we can just create um you yeah. know some specific content just around that by but uh, apart from that thank you for having me i'm looking forward to hear a lot of more startups coming to you and say, you know what, uh, Shubham, you've helped me. In your um, show, I've managed to start um, and I've listened to you guys. And this is where I am at the moment. If it wasn't for you, I wasn't going to be where I am. I'm hoping that you're going to have more of those um, testimonials. Yeah, thank you so much, actually. And uh, I will literally, uh, like, praying that yeah, it will work. And if this is a, a very insightful uh, uh, session, and I will literally thank like people, uh, you you have helped so many people. So thank you so much, Sia. Thank you so much. And we'll love to have you on our platform very soon. Uh, yeah. If not session, there's going to be a podcast. There's going to be a masterclass. There are so many things I will uh, I would like to uh, see in the future. Thank you so much. Cool. Thanks a lot. Enjoy the rest of your evening. Yeah, you too. Thank you.